So I want to welcome you. TechSoup Connect is a volunteer endeavor and it's free and everybody is welcome. And you can join the chapter or you can just attend events, but I just want you to know it's a, I hope it's a great resource for the nonprofit world and maybe even for the tribal world once TechSoup works that out. So I just want to say you can learn more about TechSoup Connect free events. You can join the Minnesota and the Dakotas chapter. And then you can always learn about TechSoup hardware and software discounts. And if you're not utilizing that resource currently for your organizations, you're leaving money on the table. So you should. And so we'll have to have a few slides about that on the end. I just want to briefly introduce the chapter co-hosts, Kathy and Marianne, and I will give them each just a moment to say hello. Marianne, would you like to start? Hi, y'all. I used to live in Texas. I have an accent when I want to, but I live in Minnesota right now, and I'm really happy to be part of this group so we can connect and learn and network together. So great to be here. And I'm Kathy Ehlers. I live in the Twin Cities area in Minnesota and um, part of the legacy group that came from the old meetup that we had for a long time. Okay, uh, that's enough intro chit chat. I'm gonna stop talking and turn it over to Shana. And I'm not gonna introduce Shana because she knows herself better than I do and I want you to get it from the experts. All right, let's get started then. So before I introduce myself, I think it's good to start out with just the goal of this presentation, which is to show you how to use video strategically and authentically to make an impact. So summary, I'll start by introducing myself, then say, show you just why video is powerful. Cause I feel like we hear a lot of the times like you need to use video, but why exactly? And then how to keep it authentic in your videos. And then I go into just showing you how to do some DIY stuff yourself before we do a panel where I talk to our lovely panelists about how to solve a problem for them with video. Okay, so I'm Shana Jerns. I make marketing videos with my business Story House. This is my dog, Finn. He's my baby. And here's a little bit about me. So I got into video when I was 13, making YouTube videos. And I feel like it's really internet videos and YouTube videos that inspired me to pursue the career versus a lot of people it's film. But I think what drew me to it was it's a lot of just real people telling authentic stories about themselves. It's very vulnerable. It's not perfect. It's not super polished like a film. It's a little more raw. And I think that's what really got me to like it. And now that's the kind of videos that I get to make for other people. A little bit more about me. I have a BA in communication studies from the University of Minnesota. So I live in San Diego now. I moved here last July, but I grew up in Minnesota in Otsego. If you know where that is, it's 50 minutes north of the cities and then was in Minneapolis for seven years until coming here. I've been doing video for professionally for five years and I started my business January, 2020, right before the pandemic. Okay. Why is video powerful? Video is really a tool for connection. I feel like a video, what's different than maybe reading a, a book about someone or seeing pictures is that there's still just a level of disconnect until you actually meet them in person. But if you're presenting yourself very authentically on camera, people will feel like they really know you before they meet you. And I feel like I have that impression with people. If they see some of the videos of me talking, that's they're like, wow, you're exactly who I thought you'd be. <laughs> Uh, video conveys emotion very strongly compared to a written post. You really, you hear emotion in people's voices. You see their mannerisms, you get a sense of their personality in a short period of time. And video is just generally more engaging. There's visual changes, things are moving, there's music. It's just keeping your attention more easily. Part two, the maths. So let's show some of those st statistics that we hear about. On average, people spend 2.6 times more time on pages with video than without. Uh, social video generates 1,200% more shares than text and image content combined. Adding videos to your email can increase click rates up 300%. And viewers retain 95% of a message when they watch it in a video compared to just 10% when reading. Okay, so keep it authentic. 
why is this important? So to me, authenticity means that you're going to be more relatable. So when we are open about like our struggles and our stories and just those very human parts of who we are, it is a lot more relatable to people than just like talking about only the great things that you do. It also being authentic means that people are going to trust you more easily. So if you're more salesy or gimmicky, like they're like picking through which part is the business side, which part is really them. And by building trust, you also build these relationships with people. And then, so how do we really be authentic? It's through telling stories, sharing learning moments, showing those vulnerabilities and imperfections. I think it's also important in authenticity to make sure that your, your values and that you're incorporating them with your messages and really sticking to them and not compromising when it might be easier to. Also, like I said, not stretching the truth, not relying on gimmicks or trends. I think trends are okay to use sometimes, but generally it's better to rely on your own original content. And finally, I think with authenticity, it also goes hand in hand with just making stuff that you want to watch. Don't make stuff that you think, oh, I hope people will like this. This is what everyone is making. Do stuff that you authentically are proud of and want to put out there. Okay. So DIY video. All these platforms, I think, are great options to do DIY video. I think uh, one thing that definitely you don't want to do DIY with is like a broadcast commercial on TV or something like that. That's usually when you want to hire a professional. And another option uh, that I think is a bit more important to get extra help on is certain website videos that are going to be like watched over and over again. Those you might want to be a little more polished, but generally... I also want to bring attention to TikTok because I think there's a common misconception that it's only for dancing teens, but really TikTok has so many like little super niches within it that anyone can fit in. And then here's just some types of videos. I'm not going to read every single one, but these will get your brain thinking about what are some videos that maybe you could make. So explaining a process, telling a customer success story or a client or whoever you serve success story, meeting employees. Those are just some examples. Okay. Here's a confused penguin I found. So how um, do you choose what kind of video to make from this list? It's not only that list, it's limited possibilities. And what exactly do we put in the video? We use video strategy. Okay. So making a strategic video, really the key is to use a video brief. And a brief is just a document that kind of goes over all these topics I've outlined to ensure that we are going to be strategic throughout the process of making a video. So um, starting out with identifying a goal. So is the goal for the video to... Um, get more donations? Is it to recruit better? Is it just awareness of a service or of the whole organization? Is there any stigmas that you're trying to communicate against or roadblocks, any problems? So what is the goal with the video? The message, I think a lot of people get a little cut up in trying to, um, especially when you don't do videos often, you try to just shove in as many messages into one video as possible. Oh, we need people to know that we believe in this and we need to know that we do this service and this and usually one video you want one two max messages demographics so when you're crafting your message it's important to think about who exactly you're talking to is it a certain age group or gender is there is it friends is it family is it parents so just making sure who you're talking to distribution that's important some a lot of times videos can be posted on your website and social media but Things like YouTube, you want to have usually a 10 minute minimum for a video and TikTok. I think they can go up to three minutes max, but usually you want to keep it like under a minute. Making sure in the video brief that you understand how your brand can tie to a video, especially if you haven't done any videos yet. You want to make sure that you keep that in mind and see if there's any kind of brand standards you want to develop within video. Your values, your stories, any relevant stories to tie into the video. How do you measure it to make sure that it has accomplished your goal? And then at the end of the video, having a call to action so people know what to do next. 
So to go over this more practically, I have an example that we're going to talk through, which is Bethel. It's a church that I worked with in Houston, Texas. And even though it's religious, I just want to make sure I let everyone know, like, I'm not trying to push any religion. I'm personally not affiliated with this church or religion. It's really just an example, but their goal was really awareness. They had a new location, a new reverend, and they also had very strong and particular values that they wanted to get across. So that was the goal with the video. So we'll watch the video after I talk through a little bit more in depth how we planned out this video. <clears throat> so the message, I feel like the strongest message within their video that they want to get across was community, that this was a place that was going to be accepting. It was about having conversations that were non-judgmental and just having a stronger impact and tie into the community. Their demographic, they really described it as a unique blend of hip hop and hippies. So they had two different people that they wanted to make sure were included in the group distribution. It was an introduction video for their website, but they also were gonna put it like on their social media and highlight it in Instagram reels and stuff like that. Values tie into the message of community, so the inclusion. The story that we brought out through the video was that Vanessa, the reverend, just how her views of church changed over time and how they led her to where she is now teaching people within the church. And the call to action was pretty simple. Just stop by the church, come visit. Oops. So let me go back and let's watch this video. So it might be a little glitchy compared to watching it on your own computer, but we can always watch it later too on your own time. So it's just two minutes long. I'm going to put it in full screen. And yeah, here we go. I think people have grown from joining Bethel because their faith now has brought it. So while faith may have been about their own personal practice, it is now connected to the world. It's connected to what's happening in community. It is connected to justice. I'm Vanessa Madrogue. I am the pastor and teacher of Bethel Church, United Church of Christ in Houston, Texas. I have three wonderful children, and I am married to Kevin Monroe. I love to travel. I love to meet people from different parts of the world, and I love to get together with my girlfriends. I grew up in church, but it was not a church that I ever heard anything spoken about politics. I never heard anything spoken about what was happening in the community. I was always interested in justice. They went to law school because I love justice because I want to see equity. And it wasn't until I joined the United Church of Christ that I started to see that faith and justice were part of who Christ was, that Christ was about radical inclusivity. At Bethel, people often come who have been hurt in another church or people who are wondering how does this faith become real in the world? Where does the value of the faith come in beyond my own person? And that's what people find here. People keep coming back because they feel the love. People understand that here they are accepted exactly the way that they are. Come and experience Bethel for yourself and come and be a part of helping us to grow community and helping us to imagine what the church is and should be for this moment. Thank you for the silent claps, I see. Yes, yeah, so I finished this video for them last year and I'll reference it a little bit throughout the rest of the presentation, just a bit more about like the production side. Okay, okay, so making your own DIY video, even though I did make this video with them. There was a lot of DIY parts with it, specifically with shooting. But overall, this is the process that I recommend, like five-step process for making your own DIY video. So starting with the video brief that we talked about, then writing a script or storyboard, doing the planning of all the details, 
shooting and then editing. And overall, just a general theme, I think is important to mention that done is better than perfect when it comes to DIY. You're going to be learning over time and it's better to just get started and accept that it's not going to be exactly how you want it to be and yeah, get it done. <laughs> okay. So scripting. Um, so before I start any video after doing the brief, I like to have a good brainstorm and just let ideas flow of what could be possible during the video. If you're writing a script, cause some there's kind of two types of scripts in my mind. There's one that is you read it word for word, which is usually only best if you have a lot of experience, like reading scripts and having them sound naturally. And then the other way is asking questions and then answering them more naturally. But for anything that you might be writing to speak, make sure that it's in like a conversational tone and not in how you would write for an article or something. Also, number three, it's generally good to remember to show and not tell. So don't say that you're inclusive and you care about community. Like in the video that we just showed, make sure that you're showing it. So for them, it was talking about kind of their values and how they facilitate conversations. That's showing it instead of just saying it. Make sure through the process you're referencing your brief and keeping everything strategic. And with your message, I must mention this a little before, but less is more. You don't want to try to cram as many things as possible. Keep it simple. And then this is the general script format that you might want to use. It works better for longer form videos, like a two minute video, like a 30 second video would be hard to get all this in it, but having an attention getter to really just get people interested. I usually put like the best visual and the most interesting point at the beginning, then introducing the topic, having the meet the main points, tying it up in the ending and having a call to action. So for this video, I'm trying to remember exactly the attention getter, but I think it was just talking. It was one of like the best lines she said about how they're inclusive in some way. And then for the call to action, it was just visit us. Okay. So a storyboard, I think usually, at least when I would think of storyboard, I'm thinking like of an animation or something with like drawings and everything. And you can do that, but I think that's definitely a tool that like for very specific, like film is going to be important. But for a lot of the videos I make, I'm just organizing the video and then have a visual column. So for this one, it's introduce yourself like Vanessa did talking about her family and traveling. And then of what kind of visual can we show instead of just showing her face talking? So for her, it was clips of her doing a hobby and hanging out with her friends. But overall with the storyboard, we have the section on one side is just section, attention getter, intro, middle, end. What part of the script is going to be for each of those? What visuals do we want? Is there any special audio needs like music, text, and that's it. So you don't have to get too intense. Okay. Production planning. So this is really all the details that you want to nail down before getting started, just to ensure that you're not missing anything and things run a little more smooth. So having a shot list from the storyboard, going through all your visual ideas and transferring that into, okay, what exact clips do we need? Having a schedule. So the schedule will say like, on the day, when the mic is on, maybe Amy. So schedule will say on this day, we're doing this with this person at this location, making sure that you work out all the, the issues with people, organizing different people for different days, the legal side. So usually you want at least a photo release so that you can use people's, whatever you get in your video. And then if there's any extra equipment needs that you want to keep in mind, but generally just your phone and some quality natural light, you're going to go far with just that. Okay. Shooting footage. So the shot list that we talked about and then beyond that. So let's say it's like something I feel like for most videos that I end up needing is like the person speaking, interacting with other people. Maybe it's just like a meeting or something like that, but you want to have a variety of shots. So it's not just one shot. Okay. We got enough of them meeting with one person. We want to get a shot of them talking, a shot of the other person listening, a shot of the other person talking and them listening and just see their facial reactions. And then maybe a shot farther away to 
show the space and any movement to make it a little more interesting, like slowly panning in, just play around. That's usually what I do when I shoot. This is called B-roll. The Anything but the interview is B-roll is just play around and see what you get. Because generally, I'll talk about this a little in editing, but for the video that I just showed, I think they sent me probably two hours total of footage. And I just take a couple seconds here, a couple seconds there, and most of it I'm not going to use. So that's just good to keep in mind that like most of what you get isn't going to be what you want to use, but you just have to do that <laughs> to get enough uh, footage. Okay. And then lighting, uh, especially with phones, the sensors aren't going to be as good as like a professional camera. So just like making sure that there's plenty of lighting is going to prevent it from looking grainy. And then the last one is locked. I can't see the variety for editing. Okay. Yeah. I already talked about that. More is more. Try to get as many shots as you can. It's better to have too much than too little. Hold on. Next. Editing. Okay. So editing can be overwhelming for some people because of the technical challenges, but I think it's good to just keep in mind that beyond the technical side, it's an art. You're just creating a feeling through the timing and the pacing and what people are saying in music, and it's just going to get easier with practice. Options for editing. If you're making a TikTok or Instagram reels, you can edit it right in the app. I personally find it a little frustrating because I'm used to like being able to click around and not just use my fingers to try to like get it to start and end at a certain point. So I'd recommend using Premiere Rush. It's a free software by the Adobe products. And then if you end up outgrowing that, it'll be easy to move up to Premiere Pro, which is like the industry standard for video editing. Like they use it in Hollywood. Most people use that or there's a final cut or something like that, but I personally like the Adobe products. Okay, so that's that. Are we ready to get to the panel? I think so. I am going to just share my screen for a moment. And Shana, will that interfere with anything you're planning? Is this your last slide or do you have more to go? I could show my very last slide quick. Okay. If you are have any interest in working with me these are the types of things that i do i can do full productions helping with very beginning to the ending one video that i have that actually is the video i showed you is considered a video business card it's the introduction video so that's a package i have on my website i do consulting i can help coach or just do creative direction script writing video editing animation so if you're interested in anything feel free to reach out <laughs> okay now i'm ready I'll stop sharing if you need to. Okay. All right. And is everybody seeing the full screen okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce Chris Latsky, who is the executive director of the Northwoods Battered Women's Shelter, located in Bemidji, Minnesota. <clears throat> and Chris has worked in the human services field for 22 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry for the froggy throat. <laughs> In November of 2021, she took over as the new executive director at the Northwoods Battered Women's Shelter. And she has a BA in political science and mass comm and pre-law from Bemidji State University. And she's currently completing her master's in public administration for Hamlin University. She has a lot of social service experience, specifically in group home operations and statewide compliance training for employees. And she has a strong focus on team building and person-centered thinking philosophies. And she has a strong passion for supporting victims and survivors of domestic violence. So welcome, Chris. And if you'd like to unmute, that would be great. And do you want to do a brief commercial for the Northwoods Battered Women's Shelter and just tell people uh, a little bit about the mission and focus before Shana gets started with questions? Sure. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, like um, Becky said, I'm up here at the Northwoods Battered Women's Shelter in Bemidji. Our mission is to provide um, crisis, or crisis shelter for victim-centered advocacy and supportive services for victims of intimate partner violence. She talked earlier a little bit about values. We do have some values, dignity, safety, inclusiveness, knowledge, and stewardship into the daily operations training programs and activities of NBWS. Focus on a strength-based leadership approach 
And the shelter operates on a volunteer model system. It, we do that by individual advocacy, that's non-biased support of a victim in obtaining goals. And so we meet them where they're at. We also look at institutional advocacy, challenging systems and institutions so they respond more effectively to the needs of the people supported. Also social change. So we wanna act collectively within the cross the communities to end oppression in all forms. I guess one of our biggest goals here is we want to provide the victims and survivors of intimate partner violence and their children with a safe place to lay their head at the end of the day. I think, was that all I'm supposed to say for now? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Just a refresher for everyone for the panel. The plan is to figure out a way to help an issue or just a marketing thing with each person. My first question is just what is a goal or problem that you have recently? I guess one of our goals right now is um, community outreach. And I really, since my first six months been here, I've really been in the operations, getting to know everything, working with funders, working with the board. So now I really want to look outward. I would really, I have been focusing on staff training and education, but I really want to start doing more educational events, community of collaboration, things like that. We do have with another agency, with another executive director on the panel. We're going to be working to do Take Back the Night on April 21st. We're going to be doing a Kelly or Health Fair, some other community events. So we really get out there and get, get some education for the community, talk about our services, what we have available, talk about the emergency shelter, all of the other services that we can provide, and just letting people be aware. And I feel like there's really a stigma attached with domestic violence and just giving that education piece. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And I'm writing this down just so I didn't... Don't forget. Okay. So community outreach as a goal. I'm thinking how that could translate to a video. So how do you currently reach new people? As far as our referrals come in statewide, they can come in from other shelters. We are on a system called day one where they'll see our open beds. Typically we don't have open beds just because we're full a lot. And as of right now, we only have 12 beds. Otherwise, we may get um, referrals from mental health practitioners, from law enforcement. We may have walk-in referrals. We may get them from ER. Really, we get them from all over. Could be all over the state or all over northern Minnesota. So I don't think getting referrals is the issue. I think when I talk about the outreach piece more, I just want to educate people more on the domestic abuse cycle and kind of letting them know all the services we provide. So when you're educating, is it for people who may be in that domestic abuse cycle or would it be like a more general, like community understanding? It would depend on the audience. One of my goals is to maybe get over to law enforcement and kind of present to them because we do work closely with them. If we would have to call the police, they're here within 30 seconds. We know that because it's happened. And I do want to maintain a really good relationship with not only them, but everybody in the community. It's just educating on some of the things that are involved and typically what comes along with domestic violence. You, there are a lot of addiction issues. There's a lot of mental health issues. And knowing the referrals and all of the other places that we may have to deal with, whether it's mobile crisis services or find a mental health practitioner. Um, around and making those referrals. Sometimes this is not the right place for a person, even though they are suffering domestic abuse, they might also need to go to some place that's more intensive for mental health services. Okay. So I'm thinking maybe I'll throw out a few options. You tell me which direction we could head. So maybe a video designed for law enforcement to give them an overview. Cause I just know in general, like police could use more education on handling things that are women's issues related. So I wonder if maybe that would be an interesting direction to take for a video, just to give a solid kind of educational training to them. Or amazing. we could also go in the direction of just making like short series of videos more face towards the general population to give basic education awareness to what does the domestic abuse cycle look like and how to identify warning signs and what are the steps? So do either of those sound like a good direction or is there something else that you were leaning towards? 
I think those sound great. I think the, the first one sounds amazing. And I think even the other with the short ones as well. Okay, great. Let me just think of, let me look back at the questions I had. Data, this is Becky, and I apologize for interrupting. I just want to note that Northwood's Battered Women's Shelter is also in a unique moment in their history. They're in the middle of a capital campaign. And I wonder if you just wanted to talk briefly with Chris about what video might be able to do in helping to generate support for that campaign. Yeah. Thank you, Becky. Uh, do you want to tell me more about the campaign, Chris? So this is a very exciting time for us, as Becky said, and I, I think I talk about it almost every day. We have been in this shelter since 1978, 40 years. In fact, I worked here 20 years ago when I was in college as an overnight advocate. So I'm pretty invested in it, but we are in the middle of a $3.2 million capital campaign. Essentially, we would double our capacity instead of 12 rooms that they have to share. We're hoping to have eight like efficiency little apartments where everybody would have their own space. It would double the space that we could take in and help victims and survivors of abuse. And also we would have more space to hopefully have some of those support groups, some of those other things for people to come in for the walk-in services that we have right now, but we're very limited in space. I keep pointing out because I do work in the basement of the shelter. <laughs> That's where my office is. It, it, it's very exciting. We, we're out fundraising, writing grants, talking to community members all over because it's a much needed, much needed new shelter for space. Mm -hmm. So with the campaign, because you said you have $3.2 million to raise. Oh, to raise. Okay. I wasn't sure if like you already had that. I'm like, what's next? No, nope. we'd be breaking ground if we had <laughs> Okay. So for um, your campaign currently, how are you marketing or finding people to donate? So we have an actual um, capital campaign committee, which consists of myself, some board members, some other community members from throughout the area. And what we've been doing is writing some grants, approaching some businesses with our plan, with our whole, we have a whole big packet. I can hand up with all of these flyers. We have a personal story in there. We have a lot of our statistics and numbers. Like for example, last year we provided almost 41,000 total supports, including emotional support, safety supports, crisis intervention, counseling, emergency financial assistance almost 4,000 shelter nights. So we, we talk about the impact we're having on the community and around of all the different things we've done, the financial services we've helped with. So we're marketing that as we go out and talk about these, as we meet with boards and with foundations, the numbers we're at and where we're at. We've actually had some very generous anonymous donors donate quite a bit of money. So that is very exciting to me. And I know I, I get really excited about it because I am pretty passionate about this project. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm trying to think like within your existing marketing uh, process where a video could fit. I'm thinking maybe before people think about donating, I'm sure they go to the website or a certain page on the website. Maybe just on that donation page, a video would be good to give a summary of, I don't know if you said you hand out a brochure, but all like the statistics and numbers and the impact. I think that might be a good place to have a video to really drive home those points. So people are thinking about that before they decide to donate or not. I know we have to move on to the next person soon, but I think for that kind of video, it might be good. I think it's always tricky when you're using any stories of people that you've helped because you want to respect their privacy and make sure that they're like in a more in control position. But if there's any person that you know is like a strong advocate that you've helped, that can be a good person to get on camera. Otherwise, just yourself or other board members who have a long history with it could be another person to get on camera to talk about it and lead the video. And yeah. So that's the general direction I see, but thank you so much for talking with me, Chris. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Next, we're gonna move on to Tuary. Yes, we are moving on to Tuary Tid, and I hope my video cooperates. Oh, good, there's her beautiful face, wonderful. So Tuary, welcome, and thank you for making time to join today. We really appreciate it. So Tuary is also in a unique position in that she's the executive director and the board chairwoman 
for Sisters Need a Place, which is a nonprofit that provides advocacy and support primarily for Muslim women, but all women in crisis are welcome. And their acronym is SNAP, and SNAP offers what they call sisterhood education and economic empowerment when sisters are vulnerable. Tuary studied criminal justice at Metro State University, and she holds an associate's degree in criminal justice and corrections from Minneapolis Community and Technical College. She's a former board chair for RISE, which is Reviving the Islamic Sisterhood for Empowerment, and she's done a variety of volunteer work for nonprofits during the past 18 years, including cooking for faith-based organizations. And Tuary has three children and two grandchildren, and she didn't want me to leave out her two grand pets. So welcome, Tuary. Are you there? I can't hear you. You might be muted. Okay. I'm not sure if Tuary actually got disconnected. She was on earlier, I know. You know what? I think we might go ahead and move on to Yvette, if that's okay. Oh, here she is. She's back. She's back. Okay, great. So let's just give her a few seconds to connect and everybody can just roll their shoulders or wiggle in their <laughs> seats just for a little scratch. To Ari, welcome. I want to invite you to unmute and I just finished your introduction. And if you'd like to say a little about Sisters Need a Place, that'd be great. Uh, so sorry, my computer completely died on me. So I was scrambling to get back to you guys. So I apologize. Hi, my name's Tuary. I am the executive director of our organization, our mission. Sorry, I told Becky, I'm really camera shy. So I'm stepping out in the open to do this. Just bear with me. Our mission is to foster sisterhood with those in mind for self-sustaining development. And we work with sisters in vulnerable situations. A lot of our work is with refugees, women who suffer abuse, low-income women. And right now, our focus is reestablishing our transitional housing, which is what we are known for. We were established in 1999. And our founder was a, a bit and realized that there were not a lot of resources. And she founded our organization on that basis, along with a couple other Muslim sisters. We are a Muslim run organization, but we cater to Muslim and non Muslim women. We are, like I was explaining earlier, reestablishing our transitional housing. In March of 2018, we saw a greater need move our transitional housing to affordable. So that's what we have been doing the last years. But since COVID has come upon us, the rise in domestic abuse has skyrocketed. And so we've had a lot of interest and in calls in regards to shelter. So we are now about to do that. We're in the process of getting our house together as we speak. But right now we're also in Ramadan. So we have a campaign for we're looking to raise $75,000 to put towards our house. Yeah. Thank you for introducing me. Okay. Just so I, I make sure I understand your organization. Do you do a lot of education? Is that kind of the main thing you do? Cause you don't, you don't yet provide shelter for people. So is that the main service or what is the main service? We, at this point, we are resourcing out. We collaborate with a couple of organizations that are providing shelter and so when we do receive those phone calls we do refer out we do a lot of education we have a program called our women's sister circle where we provide education in regards to being married and because there's a lot of sisters or muslim women that have not been married and don't know what to expect so our goal is to help them understand an expectation in that regard. And that can be from anything. Okay. All right. Great. I think I got a good understanding now. Thank you. So if we were to make a video, what kind of problem or marketing goal do you have that's relevant right now? I know you mentioned that you're trying to raise $75,000 is 
Do you want to focus on that or is there anything else you'd want to talk about? Right now, that is our main focus is reestablishing our third donor base. <laughs> For years of dormant and a lot of people thought that our organization was closed. And so my goal is to reestablish our relationship with our donors and so that we can implement more programs in the organization and to uh, better staff our transitional house. And then back up questions. Okay. Your current donor. So it sounds like, yeah, you're trying to reinvigorate the relationship with them. I know do donors can be very broad, but do you see like a general kind of demographic or audience or shared values that is within your donor base? I want to say, <laughs> good question. We initially need to work more with, I'd say our middle class donors. And to, what we want to do is we want to create a sustainable income as far as when I say income donors, mm -hmm. where they will donate monthly. And in the end, it seems like they're not really donating a lot, but in by the end of the year, they've no, donated quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Makes sense. I had an idea. What was it? To reinvigorate the relationships. It sounds like probably getting across just the new things that you're working towards would be important. Um, I'm also thinking just with the monthly donation, like how could a video play into that? What I know sometimes people like break down statistics, like this money goes this far for this, or a portion of your money goes to this and this. So that might be just a helpful way to frame it, to remind people that you need that money each month, not just a one-time thing. Um, but also just a general awareness of what you are doing would be a good direction to take. Do any of those sound interesting to you or that they do actually? Um, any of those begin farther? Yeah. It, it's really funny when Becky asked me to be a part of this, this is probably oversharing, sorry. For the panel, I was explaining to her, I'm, I've been trying to build the courage to do a video, even just like for our social media. I'm really a behind the scenes person, and but I find it highly effective. And I know it's really effective to do videos versus doing uh, mass mail, email, and send outs like that. Yeah. So I feel like I work a lot with people who are like apprehensive to get on camera. So maybe we could just talk about that part of it. To me, a lot of people think that making a video just means like, you get one take and it's got to be perfect and then you post it or you go live and you have to not mess up and it's just a lot of pressure and so what i love about myself getting on camera is that i know i'm going to edit it after and it's not going to have to be perfect i can like mess up a sentence and start over and there's just a lot less pressure to like get everything across and people will redo have a one minute long video and then they mess up like one word and got to start over so I feel like that's the beauty of learning some basic editing is that there's less pressure to perform and be perfect. But I also, if you're not comfortable getting on camera, I'd say just starting out with recording yourself and not intending to post it can be a good practice just because like lifting up your phone and talking to it is, it feels weird. <laughs> it doesn't feel weird to me anymore because I've done it so much, but at the beginning, it's just, it feels awkward. It feels unnatural. So the more, if you can just do that, like once a day for two minutes and just talk about anything and mess up and not care, then I think that's going to be a really good practice just to start getting you more comfortable. Back to your, the raising awareness. I think if you want to take like a social media approach, I think TikTok would probably be a good platform for something like this and just trying to get even just like three videos a week, short videos of you. I think educational videos can be a great thing to go on TikTok. I don't think all videos have to be like super fun and flashy and bouncy. Like they can, I follow lots of pages that just like grow my mind. So I think um, going in the direction of educating people on these issues will help make them feel more comfortable if they want to reach out to you and get services in person. 
since it is such personal issues, I think it's very important to show that you're someone that's not scary to talk to and you're not going to be judging them. So showing your more like gentle personality, I think would be just an important piece of making any kind of video is that you're showing people how approachable you are. Yeah. How's that sound? That's, that's, that's good. I feel like I just stumbled through the whole, everything you just said is what I just did. <laughs> But it's okay because it's helping me mm -hmm. to be, yeah, sorry. This is Becky again. I just want to give another two second commercial for SNAP, which is one of the really um, valuable things that I think SNAP does is works as a connector between the Muslim community and particularly the African refugee and immigrant Muslim communities and mainstream organizations primarily in the twin cities that work on housing and financial literacy and emergency food and so many other meet so many other needs. So I think that's a message that's important for your video two areas that sure. you all play that connector role that is so important for people who might not ordinarily outreach those mainstream organizations. Okay. Yeah. Thank you again for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you for getting on to Ari. Okay. Evan, is that who's next? Oh, yeah. Yvette. Yvette. Yeah. And I'm sorry, my video is being slow about the move on, but it looks like it just did it. It is my pleasure to introduce Yvette. And Yvette had an earlier meeting, but then joined early. So I apologize for taking you last of that. <laughs> But Yvette uses she and her pronouns. She is the executive director of Support Within Reach, which is located in Bemidji, Minnesota, but provides advocacy for victims of sexual violence and trafficking in a 16 county region in Northwest Minnesota. And she is a graduate of Arizona State University. She formerly worked in behavioral health at the Oasis Behavioral Health Hospital and in youth services for the, am I pronouncing this right? I'm sorry, is it Gila River Indian community? Say it again. Gila. Gila, thank you, I'm so sorry also in Arizona, and she's a mother of four, a public speaker, a writer, and comedian. Welcome, Yvette. Ah, oh, thank you all for having me. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, a little bit about Support Within Reach. I've only been here from Arizona since last January, so with that, there was a lot of changes. COVID was happening, but our mission is to reduce the impact and harm of sexual violence in the communities we serve. We have 21 staff. We have six off six main offices with three actual three college offices included that we added last year when I started. We pro were providing support for survivors of sexual violence and prevention education to the community. We typically work off of four different platforms. One of them is our victims and support advocacy services, which includes our support groups, 24 hour crisis line, which we have two different crisis line numbers that you can connect for six different counties. We have one that covers Beltrami, Cass, Hubbard, and Clearwater. And then the other number covers Aiken and Itasca counties, but we typically get calls across the state. And we also get calls from other states with North Dakota being so close to us, we happen to get calls from them as well. And because we are a sexual violence resource center, we always uh, make those connections. So we're 365 days a year open and we typically work through a volunteer program, which they actually answer after hours call line. We have our one-to-one -one peer counseling, follow-up and support medical accompaniment. So some of the advocacy stuff. And then we also do a prevention and education awareness programs. So we do community awareness, which we just go on to the community, provide presentations on every aspect of sexual violence, human trafficking. We do receive a safe harbor grant for safe harbor regional navigator grant, which actually covers the 15 of the 16 counties we oversee. So we have a large reach, but through our safe harbor network, we're connected throughout the whole state of Minnesota with resources that we can provide and, and give referrals to. 
We work with uh, different age groups from preschool all the way up to high school awareness programs. And with us having our on-campus college offices, we've been doing a lot of work with the college campuses as well. So we, I believe one of the panelists had mentioned our Take Back the Night event that they're partnering with us with some other partnering agencies. We do have our systems change program, which is our, it consists of our sexual, we call it a smart teams. And so for Beltrami County is the smart. And what we do is we worked with, we, we typically work with uh, various partners within the community from law enforcement, hospital staff, legal staff, edu- the education sector, tribally affiliated and non-tribally affiliated entities. And we all work together, just bouncing off of each other. We talk through the cases and how we can just be more cohesive. The, I think the biggest thing as we were, we were talking was I'm actually, I, I introduced all of our social media stuff to our staff. So we've been really pushing it. So if you look on our website, it's a mess, but we, we don't know. So I introduced the whole idea of using TikTok because I was like, oh, they have this really cool editing software. And so I'm actually in the process of saying a thank you for, because we had karaoke for a cause last week. And so we're trying to put something together, but I think it's really good for people to know every aspect of our organization because it's so large, but how do you condense that? And I can talk, but I think pictures say a lot and just to hear what's going on. So this has been really awesome. And I would love to connect more as far as how we can work on creating something to let people know who support within reach is and our reach how we can, how people can know how to get in contact with us, where our offices are located, just the basic stuff. And yeah, so hopefully I didn't talk too much because I can go on and on, but yeah. (laughs) feel you. So for this exercise, is there, do you want to talk more about that TikTok side of it? Or is there one problem or like marketing goal that you have recently that you want to talk about the possibility of a video for? So I think the biggest one is just like, how do we do like market, like what we do? And because we are a nonprofit, we don't charge for any of our services. Mm -hmm. And so we're grant funded, but yet there's a lot like with the cost of living increases and everything, we're doing more in the community, but we still get the same amount of funds. Mm -hmm. And so how do you do more? How do you make that dollar stretch? And I think just letting people know all of the things that we do that then in return could get them like to get our donor platform to increase. Cause with COVID we did not, we weren't able to do any sort of fundraising because most of the stuff that was being done was very in close proximity. And so now we're getting back to there. We have to try to make up for what we didn't, what we did in our bring in. And, but we still, we didn't close our doors. We kept providing our services and like looking at the statistics for different counties, seeing how, how many participants, like that client related contacts, like we had over 1500 for one county for 2021 and providing over a thousand services. It just, it shows like we're out there, we're in the community, we're doing stuff, but we need. I don't know, I guess make it appealing for donors, like for people to know every aspect of the organization, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So for existing donors or to get new donors? New donors, because we do get, we have some people that they are very involved with the organization and those are like funds that like we know that they're coming in. So those are typically allocated for different spaces. But like when we're trying to expand our outreach, like to be more involved with the school, the schools are on a very tight budget, so they can't provide additional funding to support what we're trying to do. So if we're wanting to raise more awareness and have more material, so like just looking at Bemidji High School, they have uh, 1,700 students. Okay, how do we get materials to 1,700 students out of nowhere? And that's just one school of the many counties that we would potentially provide services to. So if we're wanting to do more outreach, we have to find those funding sources to give them the best possible outreach that we can do. And a lot of times people need those materials and materials cost. 
Okay, so I'm thinking a couple different directions. So if we want to do find like smaller donors and not necessarily try to find like those big donors, I think TikTok would be a good platform to start to gather that kind of audience that could make more regular small donations. But also you said you feel like you need more awareness of all the things that you do. And generally, I don't think that you could only make TikToks about we do this and we do this. I think you might need to find some kind of tie in and then have your call to action or just sprinkle in some videos about what you do. So things that might, ideas for videos that might attract a more wide audience so that later you can show them the more like specific things that you do would be like educational videos about just like bringing awareness to the issues that you help address. And also just talking about the kinds of ways that you've already transformed the community and help people. I'm trying to think beyond educational what would be a good one to do. But when you do the awareness videos, I think you could plan out ahead of time just what exactly are the series that you need to, or what pinpoint all the awareness issues that you have, and then try to figure out some kind of format of like, how could we make 10 videos all within one format of awareness? So starting off with the same like attention getter and then having the same like awareness meet in it and just figuring out like how can you make it easier for yourself to make 10 videos where they're not all super different they're within a theme and mm. uh, i think that would be a good start and just generally that's a good idea with any social media videos is try to figure out how can you make it more like repeatable so you're doing less work for each video but it looks like becky needs me to wrap this one up so thanks so much for talking with me. Was that, was any of that helpful for you? Oh, it was most definitely helpful and I will be reaching out to you. Okay. Great. Okay, Becky, what's next? Do we do a Q&A? Yes, we just wanted to open it up to make sure that folks could get their questions answered. And I want to invite Yvette and Tuary, if you want to pop an email address or some other type of contact in the chat box. If any of the participants want to reach out to you, please feel free to do that. I apologize for not thinking to suggest that when Chris was still on the call, but at this time we're opening it to all of the participants for any general Q and A that you have. And I'm going to take down the video for just a moment and then I'll share it again. Okay. I also have a Q and A screen on my, my PowerPoint if you want me to put that up. You're welcome to, if you'd like, absolutely. Or just do. Do see that we had a, a question already that was earlier. Let me find that again. Okay. Where was it? Audio, something audio related. I think it was just, how do I, oh, here, how are you recording audio with your clients? So when I am working with people remotely, which I do, I, most of my shoots are remote, like I'm helping people film with their phones when I'm not in the area. But for most videos, like with the one that you saw with the church with Bethel, I was on a Zoom call with them and they had set up their phone. They sent me like a recording of just so I can see the framing and make sure, see how the audio sounds. And then I interview them just through Zoom. Uh, so that's how I get like the interview audio. I definitely have like recommendations for people when they want to increase the quality of their audio. A lot of people will buy, it can be like $20, like a little, it's called a lav mic. You attach it, you'll see it like on the news and stuff. You attach a little microphone here and plug it into your phone. And that greatly increases the quality because you're not going to get all the echoes. And then you can have your phone farther away without decreasing the quality. So I think that's the main recommendation I have. Can you repeat the name of that mic, Shana? Sure. It's La the long name is Lavalier mic. It's or just L A V mic. That's what you want to search. Oh, here's Q and A. Okay. Let's see. Did we get other questions? Are people with strong video creation abilities born or do they develop the skill over time? I wish I could show you the first video I've ever made. Uh, I think that would answer your question. 
You definitely got to develop it over time. I think it's like any art skill really, I feel like what can set people apart after a certain point is just attention to detail and just trying to constantly improve. That's how you're going to get better is making like a very conscious effort to try to be better with each video. But there's, I, even though I got a degree in communication, I took some video courses through college. I feel like most of what I learned was just through researching on my own. Okay. Is there any other questions that I missed? I don't think I see any more. Does anybody want to um, unmute themselves and just ask Shana their question? Hi. I do. This is Patty. We, in the region, Northeastern Minnesota, there's over $5 million in scholarship funds available from various foundations in the region. And there's a big hang up that high school students have thinking that scholarships are just for the top students. They're not for a student like me who may have a 2.5 and is going off to vocational school. And, and also Students rely, lack the confidence thinking that they would get it. They say, I'm not going to get it, so I'm not going to apply. So if we were to develop a region-wide message, if the big five foundations got together, what, how would you approach that and what would be your message? Sure. My first thought is that I think it would be great for these kids to hear it from people who basically did what you want them to be doing. So kids who had a lower GPA or are going to a smaller school, just talking about it. I think that just will very literally show them that it's possible and squash that idea. But generally, I think beyond those kinds of stories, just talking about trying to inspire them of what a scholarship can do for them and how it can increase their opportunities or save them money. I think that'll be a big part and just getting them excited about applying um, to scholarships because just from when I was in college, like I did have that feeling that everyone's applying for these. I'm not going to get it. I'm not even going to try. So I think just showing how, or even showing stats of like the percent chance, even that might, I don't know if that would help if it is like a very small chance that they'll get it, but just any kind of content talking about how people have done it before in their similar situations is going to be helpful. I think, especially with that demographic, because even though I say that there's a very wide um, range of people on TikTok, it's still like the heaviest part is like the people in like high school and young adults. So I think that would be a great platform to make this kind of content and just start spreading awareness about that. Would you... Would you need like an influencer? I've been told that with TikTok, especially with our scholarship, which is math and science based, mm -hmm. that we would almost need an influencer on TikTok to develop a following. And we're just region wide. We don't need United States wide or worldwide. We just need a local uh, presence here. Yeah, I'm sure that having influencers would help. I don't think that it's ever 100% necessary. I think a lot of people just can do it organically without any paid posts. It's just going to be take more time when you're not going to be putting in any money in that way into it and just be slower. But I do, I, he must have graduated or something, but I know there's probably going to be influencers who are from like the kind of colleges that you'd want to be targeting. So that could be definitely a strong way to reach that kind of audience. I guess the issue might come from just that those influencers aren't going to have the story of getting the scholarship that you want. I think they could be a part of the strategy, but not the entire thing. Okay. That yeah. And Becky just put something in the chat. She would like to recruit some youth from the area schools to help you reach other youth via TikTok videos on school websites. So if the school websites would post them, that might be a really good strategy. We've done the other of talking about the benefits of getting the scholarships and so on. We, I think we've done a really good job with that. And we've got teachers and school counselors advocating for these scholarships. And still, you can't lead a horse. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Seems to be that lack of confidence 
in each individual that I'm not going to get it syndrome. And that's a big hang up. Yeah, no, I can see that. A similar problem I heard about recently was with just like community resources and other resources within college for students. Like the issue is people will think, oh, I, I want to save that for someone who really needs it. I don't need it bad enough to apply for it. But if usually if you're thinking that maybe I should do it, let's say for someone else, that means that you're the exact person that should be applying for it. And just because you don't want people, you need the funding to get used. And if people aren't going to be applying for it, then they don't know that the need is there. So I think mm -hmm. just getting those stories out about how it is possible to get these scholarships and the kind of people that they are meant for, I think that would be a big part of it. Just increasing the, how relatable um, it is to them. Mm -hmm. Like so they are the type of person that should be applying. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your questions, Patty. Those were good ones. So Shana, may I take back the screen again? I want to open it up at this point to all of the participants to do their one minute announcements because one of the goals of TechSoup is community building. And so we like to leave some time in these TechSoup Connect events for people to share announcements. And I actually want to start with Yvette. Yvette, do you want to give a plug for your 5K that's coming up this month? 5K? No, we actually, we have, it's our, it's our amazing race supporter style. Oh, uh, that's, okay. yeah. Share. Share. Yeah, I got scared when you said 5K. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no. I'm oh, sorry. But no, awesome. Yeah, we have, we're actually looking for community involvement. It's actually going to be in Bemidji. So if you're in or around the area and you're wanting to participate, you can check out our website or even go on our Facebook page, just type support within reach and you can register a team that's on Eventbrite and that you can get registered for that. It's for a great cause. It's going to be April 30th from... 9 a.m. to hopefully hoping to close it down by 1 p.m. that day. It's on a Saturday. So even if you're wanting to travel and do something fun with a group, you're more than welcome to get registered. And it all goes for a good cause. I talked about some of the stuff that we have um, going on. And then our other biggest thing is our Take Back the Night event, which is April 21st. That is going to be at Hobson Memorial Union at Bemidji State University. It is a both, it is a free event. So come out, support survivors, and just have a great time. It's a community collaborative. If you need to contact me for any other reason, or you'd like to talk more, my information is in the chat and I always answer. <laughs> That that's excellent. So anybody else who'd like to make an announcement about your organization, something you've got coming up, something you want us to know, some kind of a change in services, anything you'd like to share? Well, this is, go ahead. Oh, okay. I was just going to say SNAP has a fundraiser iftar coming up on April 22nd. For those that are interested, we'll be doing it at the transitional housing spot so that folks can what needs to be done and what we the changes that we've made and be accepting donations at that time as well. My information also is in the chat. If you have any questions, my number and my email. Hopefully I'll see some of you there. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Patty. Yeah, I'm with the Allworth Memorial Foundation. We just went through a process of reviewing applicants and 76 students in the Northland will be granted 20, each $20,000 scholarship to help them pay for college to pursue a bachelor's in a STEM uh, career degree. And there's a lot more kids out there that could benefit from this scholarship. And those are the kids we want to pull into thinking, hey, I could win this scholarship too. And so that's um, our application is from November 1 until January 15th, and you must be a high school senior to apply. And I'll put our website in the chat. Thank you. And Patty, if you haven't already, if you're comfortable sharing your email so that anyone else mm, like yeah, sure, sure, sure. can connect with you easily. Anybody else? Is it Rami or Romy? I'm sorry. I have all the long vowels. How do you pronounce your name? Hey, very good. No, Romy, short for oh. Rosemary. Okay. 
Yeah, no, I'm involved in a really exciting nonprofit project, and it involves the Hmong community, our Chinese community, gardening, public art, and intercultural understanding. Basically, we're putting a China garden over at Lake Phelan, and it's very exciting. So if anybody is at all interested in that dimensional project, get in touch with me. I'll put my email in the chat. We're starting phase two design and we need people who are really interested in making this public art be what they want it to be. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anything else? Want to share an announcement with the group? Something about your organization. It can be an event. It can be a service. It can be something upcoming that you think others would be interested in. Go ahead and unmute and share if you'd like to. This is Victoria. Hi. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to do a meet and greet on Facebook. So we're going to be doing that Facebook live on the 7th of May. Bring a cup of tea, sit down, ask us questions. So it's going to be me, the executive director with some of our youth readers. So we're putting together that event mid-April. We'll put that event together. So share that with other people and ask our questions and get to know us. Victoria, thank, thank you. you. Will you put that in the um, chat box so people know how to join? And also Victoria is with Legacy Family Center, which is serving again, African refugees and immigrants primarily in the Brooklyn Park community. So thank you for sharing that, Victoria. Who else would like to share an event? This is Marianne Vancura. There is a lot of federal money that's going to be released in the next year or two for digital equity efforts. And if anyone has a topic around that, that you'd like to hear about, would you please get in touch with me? And I'm putting some thoughts together on a future program event so that we can leverage those dollars for our communities. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. So. I am going to go back to our presentation. I know we're over time here, and I assume that those of you who need to leave will. I just want to, again, welcome you to get involved with the chapter, but also particularly to check out the TechSoup donated and discounted products. So you can see on the screen, there are lots of different types of products, both software and hardware that TechSoup can get you low-cost subscriptions to and discounted versions of. So please feel free to learn more about TechSoup. And they carry a lot of different brands. So they're the intermediary certifying nonprofits for a number of different types of um, products in organizations. And then you can see some of, again, the savings that you would realize. And I just want to say you're leaving money on the table if you don't currently get stuff through TechSoup. So definitely check them out. All right. End of that commercial. I just want to say that TechSoup Connect is the educational arm of TechSoup. And what they are trying to do is build community and bring nonprofits together to learn and share together. And so I just want to say they also have some forums for help that are available. And I hope that you all feel free to check those out. And I hope that you feel free to connect with TechSoup events and join the Minnesota and the Dakotas chapter or any other chapter of your choice. And we welcome volunteers. I just want everybody to know that. So if you'd like to be part of the organizing team, that's great. And you, again, will get the slides from this presentation afterwards. And I just want to say miigwech and thank you. We greatly appreciate you being here. We really appreciate having you here today. And special thanks to Shana and Chris and Yvette and to Ari. I'm really glad to have you here today.